You want to nourish and feed and leave the oral microbiome alone because it can take care of itself if given the right products and, and environment. Well, hello, everyone. Dr. David Perlmutter here. This is the Empowering Neurologist podcast, and thank you for joining us. You know, for years now, it, it, it seems like it was a new idea, but it's probably not a new idea now. We've been talking about the relationship between the gut-related organisms uh, and our health and our ability to resist becoming ill, uh, our risk for developing various illnesses in my world, like Alzheimer's, uh, multiple sclerosis, for example, but other things as well, certainly diabetes and coronary artery disease and all sorts of metabolic problems are now related to changes that are observed in the gut bacteria. Well, we're talking about the digestive system being related to important mechanisms uh, in the body. And where does the digestive system really begin? It begins in the mouth. And it's time that we embrace the notion that things going on in the mouth are really very important as it relates to our general health. We know that there are strong relationships, for example, between having periodontal disease uh, and risk for certain things like metabolic problems and uh, chronic degenerative conditions like coronary artery disease and uh, certainly Alzheimer's. Yes, what I just said was a connection between the health of our mouths and risk for Alzheimer's disease. And we're going to explore that topic today with Dr. Mark Berhenna. Uh, I'm going to tell you a little bit more about him. Dr. Berhenna is a best-selling author and a family and sleep medicine dentist who's been in practice for nearly 35 years. His practice is focused on patient-centered care and more preventive dental health care. He's a TEDx speaker, and he regularly appears uh, on national media, including National Public Radio, CNN, The Huffington Post. Uh, Prevention Magazine, Men's Health, CBS, and the Mind Body Green online site. He is the creator of AskTheDentist.com, a terrific website that I would encourage you all to look at, and that's dedicated to exploring the mouth-body connection. We talk about the gut-brain connection. This is the mouth-body connection, and that includes the brain, as well as the role of the oral microbiome, not only as it relates to oral health, oral health, but also overall health in general. Uh, most recently, he's been advising an oral microbiome testing company called Bristle to help establish the importance of the oral microbiome in health and his mission by becoming a healthcare influencer, which he is now, has been and continues to be to illustrate to patients as well as to providers that optimal health cannot be achieved by ignoring oral health. New ways to look at oral health and how it is connected to systemic health will be the focus of our time together. Let's jump right into the podcast. Well, Dr. Brahena, thank you for joining us today. We've got, uh, our viewers should know, you and I have already been talking, there's a lot to cover. Uh, but in the a blog that I've written about our interview today, I begin by uh, exploring the notion that, you know, everybody talks about the relationship of the so-called microbiome and in health and disease. And I think if you ask somebody what is a microbiome, they'll tell you, well, it's the organisms that live in the gut, predominantly the large intestine, and how they play a role uh, in terms of affecting our longevity, our health, et cetera. But let's talk about the uh, digestive system and where it begins, where your specialty begins. And I really want to focus in our the beginning, the first part of your interview with why the bacteria within the mouth, uh, what is their role in terms of health and why it matters? Uh, the oral microbiome, uh, it does matter a lot. Um, it is, I mean, I see myself uh, as a super organism, not just a human, but also a host of bacteria, fungi, I mean, yeast cells. Um, you know, uh, it, it's really more about a synergy between two different organisms that make a superorganism. And when the biomes, whether it's the gut microbiome, the oral microbiome, any of those biomes, armpits, uh, we probably have a brain biome, who knows? Uh, those, those are, we do. yeah. And they are key to our survival and longevity and quality of life and 
cognition and happiness. I mean, our state of being. And and I'm just glad that the oral microbiome is getting its moment now. It 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 was discovered after the gut microbiome. Uh, the gut microbiome, of course, is the big one, but the oral microbiome is second in diversity and in size. And who knows how it fits in with importance? But as you said, it is uh, it is the headstream. It is the uh, upstream, uh, the headwaters of the gut, and who knows of of what else. And there are so many links to to systemic disease from oral bacteria. It's six out of ten chronic diseases have some oral bacterium uh, involved in it, whether it's direct or indirect, whether it's just by inflammation or injury via a, uh, a toxin that gets released by those bacteria in the blood, uh, these bacteria in the mouth, and it can be a direct infection. I mean, P. gingivalis has been found in the brain and it's in the mouth and it's the driver of gum disease. I mean, the mouth is an open Petri dish where the gut is a little bit more protected. And of course they're connected. I, I'm no a little bit about the one-way connection, you know, what all the bugs in the mouth that do get swallowed in saliva, some get across the stomach uh, acid barrier or filter, whatever you want to call it. But now we're discovering a two-way connection, a, a back and forth connection. And now recently there's a study out of, I think it's Japan in November, last November, there's now a, 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 a oral, there's a, we know about the gut brain axis. And now they're referring to this oral microbiome to the brain axis, to the gut axis. And it, the study focuses on depression, bipolar, mental, uh, you know, it disease. should not be a surprise. And I think for our, right. many of our viewers who have been following the various, uh, stories that we've talked about, the relationship of inflammation, uh, to depression, for example, the, how we can induce depression in laboratory animals and in humans by enhancing inflammation within the human body, and that can be done uh, experimentally. So that should not be a surprise. The relationship between permeability of the gut, for example, and inflammatory disease of the gut and depression. So what you're talking about is that, no surprise, there's a lot now related in terms of what's going on in terms of oral health and risk for things like coronary artery disease and what I'm, I'm hoping we're going to focus on today, and that is Alzheimer's. And in our discussion prior to going uh, on the recording, um, I mentioned, you, you asked me uh, why, you know, why the interest? And I, I quoted Desmond Tutu, and I'll, I'll quote him again, saying that the, the quote is something along the lines of, you know, we spend, uh, it's important to pull people out of the river, that's for sure, but we really should go upstream and ask, why are they falling in in the first place? Mm -hmm. That's my mission. And you are going to open up uh, a new avenue for us to understand in terms of why does the brain accumulate beta amyloid? Why are tau, uh, why is tau protein phosphorylated? These are th things that are seen in correlation with Alzheimer's disease. And it turns out that there's some really powerful science that relates an organism that you just described, P. gingivalis, uh, in terms of these mechanisms. Now, it's not the whole story, but we've known for quite some time that people who have poor dental health uh, are at a higher risk for things like coronary artery disease and Alzheimer's. So at the end of this, you know, my hope is that you can give our viewers tools based on the premise that, hey, what's going on in your mouth plays a huge role in terms of your brain's destiny. Who knew? And I, I, I asked you about a book because it really seems to me that'd be an amazing book to write. So Let's start, uh, let's talk about this organism and Porphyromonas gingivalis, let's call it P. gingivalis. It's in the mouth. You indicate it's responsible for gingivitis or inflammation of the gums. But let's unpack this relationship between this organism and bad things that are going on in the brain. Right. So this is an organism that we've known about for quite quite some time. Um, we I remember back in my early years as a dental student, they were talking about a vaccine. Um, and that was 30, 40 years ago. And of course, the vaccine has not appeared. It's it's more complicated than that. The oral microbiome was just was first quantified um, very crudely, I, I may add, may add uh, in 2005, 2006. And we're better at it now. We have great oral microbiome testing, and we can talk about that later. But the P. gingivalis, like other 
pathogens or anaerobic bacteria, whatever, whatever, however you want to categorize them, they are in our mouth right now. You could be perfectly healthy. This bug, of course, is one of the, the, the big players in gum disease, which is a inflammatory response to a, an invasion of bacteria past a very delicate barrier like no other in the body. We can talk about that too if you want. Um, and it's a cytokine response. And for example, during COVID, uh, if you had gum disease, that was a risk factor for uh, getting a severe infection or even death uh, from COVID. So some have called it an autoimmune disease, but this bug, and there are others, but this is the, the main one, this bug is in our mouths right now, just like an H. pylori bug is. Uh, or like yeast cells that cause candidiasis in the mouth. All these bugs are present in the mouth. And it's the relationship of the bugs to each other. It's kind of a, you want diversity, but you don't want too much diversity. No diversity is a bad thing. The analogy that I like to use is my vegetable garden right out here. Um, the, we the weeds are there. You can pick the weeds and focus on the tomatoes and the peppers and... and but the weeds will come back or they may not come back. The, they're in the soil if you treat the soil correctly and if the plants that are thriving are thriving well, they push back on the weeds. So these players are all there. We all have it. Dentistry, unfortunately, has been looking at it incorrectly for decades, even centuries for that matter. And we've been trying to disinfect, eradicate that bug, uh, or as I mentioned before, uh, find a vaccine for it. And actually, this bug is needed. A lot of the bad bugs, when in certain numbers and interacting with the other bugs properly, they do great things. So it's really a, a discussion about whether you're dysbiotic, whether these bugs are out of control, certain populations are out of control, the bug that causes decay, uh, the bug that causes uh, the bugs that cause uh, halitosis, bad breath, or are they in check and under control? And if so, then there is essentially a lack of of oral disease, uh, you, you're in good health. So, but when these bugs are out of control, they're elevated in population, they're suppressing or pushing back on other bugs, bugs that do good things. And of course we feed this environment. We either feed it well, or we, or we uh, give it too much sugar, too many carbohydrates. Uh, and then these bugs uh, essentially uh, can outproduce the other bugs. And so fiber is important. Diet, as you would imagine, is very important. But if that is not done, which most of us are not doing well because of the Western diet, the P. gingivalis bug will get to the brain. It will literally, it'll excrete the substance called the gingipan. Uh, I mean, you're, you're going to know more about this than I am. I just know how it gets there. It is, and it, it can happen within days. Uh, it can happen in a low-grade version of periodontitis, otherwise known as gum disease. This is one of the most prevalent diseases in the world right now. Uh, under age 40, 50% of us, in this country, for example, but all over the world, uh, even in this country with good dentistry, 50% of us have that. Over age 65, it's up to 75%. Uh, that Those are phenomenal numbers. This is a chronic disease that very few people uh, talk about. And it's a disease that can lead to another more serious disease, and that is Alzheimer's. And the mechanism of how it gets there is poorly understood, but we've got three working theories, and it is absolutely fascinating to see how that happens and scary at the same time. Yeah. And I think there's great evidence. I mean, uh, for our viewers, I think to, to embrace the uh, the notion, uh, the predicate for what we were, are going to talk about or are talking about today, that there are certain bacteria in the mouth that may cause Alzheimer's in and of itself. That's that's a uh, kind of a challenge to get your arms around that. I mean, after all, Alzheimer's is a disease of beta amyloid in the brain. I need to get some kind of vaccine or drug to get rid of the beta amyloid. Problem solved. Not true. I mean, we've witnessed last year... Uh, um, the Aduhelm uh, fiasco where a drug was created that uh, was designed to target beta amyloid and how that turned out not to be a meaningful drug. And now we have Lakembi that is being approved. Mm -hmm. uh, and, you know, the reality is that it has a minimal effect in terms of slowing cognitive decline. People still decline cognitively. And new news, 
uh, I'll do a podcast on this. Uh, as of three days ago, it looks as if the data that looked at the follow-up brain scans on people treated with these types of drugs shows significant shrinkage uh, of the brain in comparison right. to controls who have the disease and yet were not put on that drug. I saw oh, that. Uh, yeah. And the, the thing is, the researchers had that data and of course it was they just... Did. Yeah, and it was it wasn't disclosed, so that's going to be an unraveling story. And I, you know, I, I would like to be very straightforward and indicate that I'm all in favor of a cure for Alzheimer's, even pharmaceutical. I think it, it's wonderful, and I think it'll come. Matter of fact, drugs that seem to target brain metabolism have a lot of potential moving forward. Uh, we'll discuss it at another time, but again, upstream, and I think we've identified that one important player upstream seems to be the relationship of the very organism, that bug that you describe, getting into the brain or perhaps secondarily influences the brain by turning on inflammation. We know that inflammation is a cornerstone mechanism that relates to Alzheimer's, and this bug can do that. Inflammation in and of itself leads to neuronal death, but also compromises how insulin works in the brain and therefore the, the bioenergetics that relate to Alzheimer's as described in the Journal of the American Medical Association. So this is really uh, what we're, we're talking about today is not way out there. It's very mainstream, but I'm trying to figure out why it is that there's a disconnect. Is it because dentists deal with the mouth and doctors and neurologists deal with the brain and the heart and uh, what is the disconnect? Uh, you know, and maybe we'll just push through that. And in the time that we have, uh, talk about some of the evidence then that relates this organism to Alzheimer's. And then I think importantly, a few other topics I want to get to, but I think our viewers would like to know, okay, I get it. I understand what you're talking about. Uh, what do I do? Uh, right. What do I do to keep this from happening, to maximize my oral health? And you mentioned something I think really important that there's this notion that we've got to, you know, get rid of all the bugs in the mouth. You watch television commercials even today, and there's this and that that will kill 99% of mouth germs. You know, there, there you, for you have a fresh, clean mouth, tastes like mint, and you can kiss people and they're not going to be offended, right? <laughs> do we really want to do that? I'm not, no. not suggesting we want to have bad breath or not have oral care, but is gargling with something that wipes out the oral microbiome that temporarily, is that really a good idea? So first, let's focus on some of the substantiation of this relationship of this organism uh, to ultimately Alzheimer's. Right. So you, you brought up some very good points. Uh, there needs to be more connective tissue between physicians and dentists, for sure. That's important. Uh, and we have been practicing in parallel universes, and we really need to, the curriculum has to change, or I, I'm not sure how that can be fixed. So the, the P. gingivalis, uh, again, which we all have, uh, can pretty, I won't give you the, the gory details, so to speak, but uh, the, minute, the minute it crosses this biological width, that's the term we use, there, there is a very unique place in, in the body where an inanimate object sticks out through the body. And as you can imagine, it's, it's not a fingernail, that's different, that's just an extension, that's like a skin, a keratinized skin. This is a calcified bony structure with a unique structure over it, enamel, that is literally sticking out of the body. How does the body, it's like a feeding tube. How does the body keep that area clean where bacteria can enter? And it has a very complicated kind of mechanism of dealing with that, periodontal ligament, uh, kind of a, uh, a girdle of tissue that hugs the tooth. There's a pocket there, but that can break down. And once that breaks down, anything in the mouth, any bug, uh, any uh, toxin, uh, food, for example, which can get infected once it enters that submental space, uh, this creates a, an incredible, oh, I don't want to use the word overreaction, who knows what it is, but uh, a lot of bleeding, a lot of inflammation, a lot of blood goes to that area, and the blood supply to the gums is similar to the blood supply in the Bowman's capsule in the kidney. It's tiny. And of course, high blood pressure blows all that out, that dies off, that tissue dies, and you get gum recession, which a lot of people ask about. That's one of the major causes of receding gums, and that never comes back. It's very hard to fix that. But as soon as that, as soon as the tissue gets necrotic and fibrotic and it starts flapping, 
it's not soft and elastic like a girdle around the tooth, that's when things start going bad. And th these bugs enter the bloodstream. So what do they do once they get into the bloodstream? They go to places where the body's not used to seeing them. And maybe the host defenses are not as good as they should be. This bug will cross the blood, the blood brain barrier. I, I, it crosses the placental barrier as well. Uh, that's why women that have gum disease or even inflammation, gingivitis, they have, there are a lot of complications, uh, preterm and, and low weight births, um, which is pretty common. We've known about that for a long time. In fact, it's on a lot of, uh, uh, you know, forms that moms fill out. Uh, again, this can all be prevented before conception. Uh, if we can prevent the inflammation in our mouth, the chances of letting a causative agent an infectious bug that can cause Alzheimer's into the brain. And I think I'm using that term correctly. Correct me if I'm wrong. This is a new source or cause for direct cause of Alzheimer's, uh, an oral infection. Uh, then that is, that is significant. That's significant knowledge to have in your kind of healthcare regimen. We'll talk about all the ways to, to prevent. Uh, and even if you have gum disease, how to properly deal with that. But that that is information that I wish I had had a long time ago. My mom died of Alzheimer's and she had periodontal disease. I remember treating her uh, for many, many decades. And, and it, you know, who knows why that was, but that's another discussion. But this is you pretty know, I, important. I think, yeah. Our, uh, our viewers are probably saying uh, maybe a little surprised that uh, we're, we're having a discussion about a, a mouth related bug that- right might well cause Alzheimer's. Right. Uh, you know, I'm certainly not saying, nor are you, that that is the cause. Right. But let's just be clear what the science shows, that this organism is able to secrete various chemicals that cleave and activate beta amyloid. Everybody's exactly. talking about beta amyloid. That's the premise by which these drugs are being developed and also causes the phosphorylation or makes tau protein more of an issue in the brain. So we can see that. We can see that in the laboratory models of uh, animals that are uh, destined for Alzheimer's disease, we can see that you know this activity happens. So we have a pretty clear understanding about not just that it does happen, but actually the mechanics of how it happens and what it's actually doing. So it's not speculation. And you know, you brought up a very, uh, very interesting point, and that is in the gut, we rely on the, the barrier, the, the lining of the intestine. We talk about gut permeability. We've been talking about it in this program for an awful long time, long before it was popular, mm -hmm. uh, uh, increased gut permeability or leaky gut syndrome. And what you're uh, making clear is that because of the, the breakdown that happens in our tissues in the pockets around our teeth, that that's a, a highway to the bloodstream. Absolutely. where these organisms do not belong. The next uh, roadblock is hopefully the blood-brain barrier to keep these organisms and or their products like mm -hmm. lipopolysaccharide from getting into the brain. And as we age, the, the effectiveness of our so-called blood-brain uh, barrier declines. It also declines with metabolic conditions like diabetes, uh, cigarette uh, smoking threatens it as well as does mm -hmm. certainly poor nutritional status. And how interesting it is that things like poor nutritional status, sedentary, uh, sedentary poor educational level, diabetes mm -hmm. are all associated with periodontal disease and Alzheimer's disease as well. So in terms of having evidence, I think it's really quite clear that these are well-established uh, pathways that we've known about for a long time. Even some speculation now that uh, the organism may actually travel through the fifth cranial nerve and get immediate access yes. to the to the temporal lobes, right. uh, which is you know where the hippocampus lives. And as such, uh, I mean, we've had this discussion for many years as it relates to herpes simplex type one, i.e., cold sores, which we know are dramatically associated with Alzheimer's risk. So we know the highway is there. The question is who's going to take that highway, right? And when? And when you bring up another very good point that we all have a P. gingivalis in our mouths at any given moment. Friend or foe, don't know. But your analogy oh. of your vegetable garden, uh, the weeds don't grow when the garden is tended. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think that, uh, you know, what we need to understand is, uh, and I'm telling you this having been 
having uh, been to the dentist this morning, having my teeth cleaned, oh, thinking wow. about this upcoming interview. <laughs> and the dentist, I mentioned to him, showing me a pamphlet that he has saying that, you know, gingivitis is related to heart disease. And uh, I am thinking I'm going to be interviewing you today and talk about this. But that said, um, it's ch it's challenging to think how we might target this. Let's move our discussion to uh, uh, the feature of biofilms and tell us what that's all about. We, we've heard about it, you know, we call it other things in the mouth, but why do these bacteria create biofilms and live in this, in this way? Uh, what, what's the advantage for them and why does that make cleaning up the mouth even more challenging? Right, that's a really good question. So when I was in dental school, the biofilm was evil. It had to be scraped off, removed, disinfected, uh, taken down, and when it came back, which we weren't told back then comes back in 20 minutes and reorganizes, uh, then, you know, you, you do it again. And a lot of these oral, uh, care, oral health products are designed to do that. And that's a very simplistic approach. The biofilm actually is a, an incredibly beautiful way of the body dealing with inanimate objects. And it allows the bacteria that will actually, if they combine together, can actually help that inanimate object. For example, one of the functions of the biofilm, and again, we're talking about plaque. That's a term that we used to use. Um, this is a proteoglycan layer. It's got a lot of protein. It has enzymes in it. And then it invites or brings in all the bugs in, in the biome and they live together. And if they're living well together, communally or commensally, then for example, one of the functions of the biofilm is to help remineralize demineralizing areas of the teeth. And that essentially is reversing small cavities as they are happening. And actually, it's happening in your mouth right now. Uh, it was happening while you were at the dentist. It, it happens more readily after a meal because your bacteria, and again, that oral microbiome is being fed by what you eat. That's where it gets most of its support and nutrition, or that's where most of the harm is done by feeding it easily fermentable, broken down carbohydrates. I like to pick on goldfish crackers, uh, just because they look so delightful and safe and cute, but it's really as bad as anything. Candy, uh, you know, a, a fructose uh, based uh, beverage. And so uh, the biofilm is incredible. Do we want to remove it with an abrasive toothpaste and brushing and, and flossing doesn't really remove it? We want to disrupt it if in fact it is growing too thick and growing in a, in a, uh, a dysbiotic way. Uh, th thickness is important. Uh, its size is important uh, because you want it to be permeable. It, it has to have permeability. There are calcium ions, phosphorus, boron. Uh, there, there are all these uh, minerals that are in saliva that have to get through, have to be taken up and then processed and get through that biofilm. So we really want to disrupt the biofilm if, in fact, it is a problem. We do not want to remove it. In fact, if you do not have a biofilm, your teeth literally will, will destruct, self-destruct. Also, your teeth will be very sensitive to cold, to certain foods, uh, to uh, touch. If you were to brush a tooth without a biofilm, the biofilm encircles the tooth as it's erupting in a child. That's how quickly it forms. So these bacteria, this is a protective mechanism for themselves, it, it, it allows them to survive. They cannot survive alone. They have to survive on a biofilm. And it also allows them to perform different functions. And one of them is remineralization. There are immune functions so as well. What, whoever has told, uh, at least our audience, uh, that there are some really important good things that your mouth bacteria are doing. Again, getting back to the commercial of eliminates 99% of germs in your mouth. You see the guy <laughs> swishing or whatever. Right, right. Listerine. As, as we should have expected. Yes. As we should have expected that the bacteria living there are doing some great stuff. Right. Can we dive, digress for just one sure. moment? Sure. What other good things are our, our mouth bacteria doing? Uh, they produce a transient gas, nitric oxide, NO. Uh, I mean, that's that's probably the elixir for youth right there. That's what Ponce de, de Leon was looking for mm -hmm. in Florida. And, and it's it turns out it's in all of us. We, we are able to produce that typically by age 40, you know, the endothelial cells and other cells in the body, that, that production value drops, but the mouth keeps on going. There are bacteria on the back of the tongue 
part of the oral microbiome, of course, that actually when they see a, a like a beet or a, a high nitrate food, they will produce NO. And of course, NO lasts for, I think it's a quarter of a second, uh, milliseconds. And it, so it has to be always produced. And NO has amazing effects. Again, in the mouth directly, it's a, it has immune responsibilities and, and effects. Uh, it, it helps vasodilate uh, blood vessels. Uh, the body cannot treat and fight infection where it can't get blood to. So, um, it, I mean, for example, I mean, we, we, you, you mentioned kill 99% bacteria. That's the Listerine uh, uh, oh. ad, uh, has been for a long time. I think they've dropped and, it and since. And Lister had nothing to do with Listerine, I might add, but Right. Go ahead. <laughs> um, they uh, that actually elevates the use of a mouthwash that disinfects, which again is only for 10, 15 minutes. The oral microbiome is incredibly resistant. It it pops back up, although arguably not in the proper form. Um, so you you swish with mouthwash twice a day. These are studies from 2005 and and even recent ones. I just read a new one that popped out yesterday. And it actually elevates your blood pressure within two to three days. And obviously, that is because the NO production is, is uh, compromised. And now, excitingly, I, I got very excited about this study just a few weeks ago, tongue scraping. So if you tongue scrape, which I've been a big proponent of it, we'll talk more about it in the solution part of this uh, episode, uh, tongue scraping actually decreases your blood pressure which is kind of conversely to, it's the converse of killing the bugs. But if you can, you know, manage that biofilm on the back of your tongue, which is, one, by the way, one of the niches of the oral microbiome, there are several, then you can actually promote NO production by keeping those bugs happy and by keeping that biofilm layer on the back of your tongue in, in great shape. So that's pretty exciting. I think that, to me, uh, tongue scraping is as important as brushing and flossing. Well, let me just comment on the nitric oxide vis-a-vis uh, -vis our discussion about Alzheimer's. I mean, here we're talking about a, uh, a mechanism whereby nitric oxide production in the mouth uh, is going to be compromised and, and the importance of nitric oxide. One uh, in silico study from last year, looking at over 6 million patient records, looking for candidates for an Alzheimer's drug ended up out of, I think, 60 or 70 candidates focusing on one. And it was a drug called sildenafil, also known as Viagra. And it looked like the that individuals who used Viagra had about a 60% reduced risk of developing Alzheimer's. What does Viagra do? It increases nitric oxide. That's how it increases a blood supply for uh, for men who have erectile dysfunction, as an example. So, I think your your discussion that goes down that uh, rabbit hole of the role of nitric oxide in health throughout the body, I think, is really very important. And I'm glad you brought that up. So, well, there, excuse me. There are studies. Uh, I forgot to mention there are a lot of good studies uh, that if you have gum disease, you, you are likely to have erectile dysfunction. Again, that is that is directly linked to the condition and the state of the oral microbiome. So. NO is, is uh, very important, the production of it. Just say NO. NO. Yes. Yep. <laughs> so um, we then depend upon this biofilm. But on the other hand, the biofilm seems, could be looked upon as a defense mechanism then for P. gingivalis. Mm -hmm. in, terms of, uh, in terms of our efforts, if we're going to target P. gingivalis vis-a-vis -vis some kind of treatment or even mentioning years ago a vaccine, that somehow the biofilm seems to be its way to seclude and, and hide itself. That's correct. Uh, in fact, there are, I, I think this, uh, this whole Gingipan uh, P. gingivalis uh, study was very recent, 2016, I think, at UCSF here in California. And there have been several since then. Uh, they, uh, of course, the drug companies are focusing on suppress suppressing the Gingipan production the P. gingivalis bug producing this, I think it's a protease. And uh, if they could, they think if they suppress the gingipan, then they won't get the amyloid plaque. Uh, unfortunately, that's a very narrow way of looking at it because there's so many other ways you can get Alzheimer's. So, so the biofilm, again, we need a broader approach. Uh, as you said earlier, your quote, um, uh, you know, wh why are people falling into the river so early? Why do we see teenagers with periodontal gingiv uh, you know, gingivitis and periodontal disease. 
uh, it's, it's something that is, of course, related to our environment, our diet, our way of life, uh, more mouth breathing than usual. The, the mouth is very susceptible to pH changes because it can dry out very quickly, unlike the gut. Uh, if you sleep with your mouth open all night long, you are disrupting your oral microbiome. The pH will drop to 3 2.8, which is quite low. Uh, if you drink a lot of acidic drinks and you're talking a lot, for example, for a living, and, or you can't breathe through your nose, you're breathing through your mouth, you're exercising with your mouth open, you're dehydrated, this affects the pH of the oral microbiome and allows the, the, you know, the bad bugs like P. gingivalis and S. mutans to, to, to take hold. Uh, so there are a lot of factors that will alter the what's living in that biofilm. And that biofilm is important to not disinfect because that just makes it worse. We have to feed it. We have to nurture it. And, you know, it's confusing to a lot of people because we've been telling them for a long time to, to you know, destroy uh, what's inside there, to nuke it, to clean it up and to keep at it. And now people, I think, are, are a little nervous. They're like, well, what if I'm over brushing? What if I'm using the wrong toothpaste? Uh, there are a lot of toothpastes out there that are antibacterial disinfectants. They have uh, pesticides in them. They have soaps, antibacterial, uh, uh, um, antiviral substances. Um, and that's not what you want to be using. So it's really about nourishing the oral microbiome. That is now the key. It's not about disinfecting your mouth. Uh, you know, washing your mouth out with soap, like mom said, was, was, I think that was more punishment than anything else, just the taste of it. But it, it really had no <laughs> And it no was benefit. ivory soap in the day, by the way. I'll right, never exactly. Been there. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I had forgotten about the mouth washer, because if you said- We're still using dirty soap word. in our toothpaste. It is soap. It's uh, surfactants, emulsifiers, and and that is unfortunate. But that that is changing. We, we've got better products. They're mostly direct-to-consumer boutique brands, some of them don't get it right, unfortunately. They don't have any science behind it, but it is coming. Uh, Europe, uh, out of Europe, uh, Japan's been using wonderful uh, products developed by NASA, uh, coincidentally, uh, for 40 years. And, and that stuff now is slowly becoming available in the U.S. And I'm sure Colgate and Crest and even Listerine, I have seen signs that they are watching to see when the public switches over and gets it. And I think hmm. we're, we're approaching that moment, maybe in 10, 15 years. So these are uh, toothpaste then that are less threatening uh, in terms of balance, but nonetheless are still going to be appropriate uh, ways of, of cleaning your teeth and, and, and presumably your gums. Right. The, I don't like using that term cleaning. We are mm -hmm. nourishing. We are feeding the teeth. So one of nourishing, the- Nourishing, so yeah. something very positive. Well, I mean, it's a biofilm. It's a living thing on an inanimate object. And that biofilm is key to the survival of that tooth, the protection. If that biofilm, for example, when we get receding gums, the dentin portion of the tooth is exposed, which is, all, it's like bone. It's only about 50% calcified. Enamel is almost like glass. Uh, it's 97, 98% uh, calcified, very smooth, hard, inert surface. But the dentin is exposed quite often, especially as we get older. That's what causes sensitivity to drinking a cold drink or a, you know, or a balsamic vinaigrette dressing. That will produce a response because there are nerves in that surface. That surface needs protection. And when it decalcifies, it needs that biofilm to rejuvenate it. Where does the biofilm get the building blocks for recalcifying that area from the saliva and it pulls from the saliva. So the way I see toothpaste, and I'm not a big fan of mouthwash because even an inert safe mouthwash is just, it, you might as well switch with water. But the toothpaste has is made in such a way, if it's made properly, to uh, present, provide an optimally shaped, ionically charged particle of calcium of hydroxyapatite, of boron, phosphorus, um, all these minerals that are in tooth structure and to make it available, the biofilm sees it because it's ionically charged, it grabs it, it crosses that biofilm and it literally builds itself onto that area that is trying to turn itself into a cavity. That is so key. That's not cleaning teeth. That is providing and nourishing for teeth. That's feeding the good guys. That's helping the bacteria or at least not knocking them down or killing them, that's providing for the bacteria and helping the oral microbiome be commensal in, in a commensal state, not a dysbiotic state. If the S mutan bug is out of control and the best way to do that is feed it sugar, that is a acid producing bug that will 
shift that equilibrium of remineralization between remineralization and demineralization more to the demineralization side. Hence, we get cavities. One very popular component in toothpaste is sodium lauryl sulfate. Uh, why is it there and is it a threat? It is a threat. Um, it's not as much of a threat as perhaps fluoride is, but it is ubiquitous in toothpaste. It is a manufacturing chemical uh, that uh, it's a surfactant emulsifier that is there to allow these companies to make very large batches of toothpaste. And then when they fill it, each toothpaste is properly mixed. That way they can mix it more quickly. It stays in suspension. And then of course, when it hits your mouth, there's really no benefit there other than it helped make a very inexpensive toothpaste and for a good profit margin. And what it does though, is it affects, it can literally break down the lipid layer in a cell. That's bad. It can actually cross over into the blood supply uh, through the oral mucosa. We've got plenty of rat studies that that show and demonstrate that. Again, the oral mucosa is much like the lining of the gut. And if it's irritated, if it's been, um, what is the word, dried out or... Um, the 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 uh, turbidity of of the cell layer. If that's disturbed, then more of the bad bugs get cross over into the blood supply. So you want to keep the lining of your mouth in good shape. Surfactants, uh, SLS, of course, not a good thing. There are probably fifty different variations now of SLS naturally der derived. They still they may be natural from coconut instead of from a chemical, but they still have the same function, and that is to help the mix. And then when it comes into contact with the oral mucosa, it breaks that down. And that is obviously not a good thing. And it, it causes foaming. I don't know if you like foaming toothpaste. I don't. Makes a mess. Some people do. But this, these are ingredients that should not be in our toothpaste. They disrupt the oral microbiome. You want to nourish and feed and leave the oral microbiome alone because it can take care of itself if given the right products and, and environment. There seems to be a very recent push uh, to add charcoal to toothpaste. Mm. Uh, and the toothpaste is black. Uh, my sense is that charcoal might be too abrasive, but what are your thoughts? Well, some versions, it depends on how the charcoal is made. First of all, charcoal does not have a whitening effect. It is good at perhaps, and not as good as another ingredient, which we can talk about later, at adsorption, not absorption, but adsorption Ad of pulling uh, tannins off a tooth, off the pellicle. When a tooth is stained, it's the biofilm on the tooth that is stained. Uh, eventually the stain can get through the biofilm and, and get incorporated into dentin, less so enamel because enamel is so smooth. Um, but charcoal can pull, uh, tannins and cigar stains, uh, uh, tea stains, wine stains, but it doesn't do a very good job. And if it's a good, well-made charcoal, again, you can refine any organic product like that into a small, uh, particle size where the RDA, the relative dentinal abrasivity index is low. So just if you're using a charcoal toothpaste, just make sure you know what the RDA is of that toothpaste. And if it's below 30, you're fine. If it's some of these toothpastes are designed to be very abrasive and that's how they whiten your teeth. They're scraping the pellicle off and they're very damaging to the actual enamel surface and very damaging to dentin because it's softer. And by the way, the SLS, we've had studies for the last 20 years showing that to, uh, SLS is one of the major causes of oral canker sores. And again, that goes back to that breakdown of the oral mucosa. SLS breaks it down and predisposes you to these very painful uh, canker sores, uh, traumas. So again, the, that's sodium lauryl sulfate. sulfate. Generally, that does appear on the label. Right. And, is but there, there any... There are lots I'm of sorry. versions. Cocal succinate, which is a coconut dry version. It's still an emulsifier. Is there any... Um, commercially available toothpaste that you'd put your stamp of approval on? Right. Not yet. Uh, there are two that I recommend because they have this incredible ingredient in it that allows us to, to eliminate fluoride, uh, hydroxyapatite, but they also use naturally derived. Uh, again, the SLS uh, is low on the scale. I, I would prefer that it's not in toothpaste. There is a toothpaste that uses bentonite clay, uh, but it doesn't have a remineralizing agent in it. It's made by Redmond. 
Um, I, I want to hold on. A I I want to get my pen. Yeah. So it, it's it has bet night clay in it, which I think would be a good thing. Oh, it's right? wonderful. Yeah. And bet night clay, the- pharmaceutical oh. grade bet night clay is wonderful. Some people worry about the lead that is naturally found in bet night clay. You can get refined versions of it, um, and it's uh, but it doesn't have the this new miracle ingredient that hopefully we'll talk about that. And of course it doesn't have fluoride in it, which is good, but fluoride does work. Fluoride topically does help remineralize teeth. The problem is we don't know how we really don't know what the mechanism is. And we do know that fluoride gets absorbed through the oral mucosa. But right now, Redmond, if you, if you're, if you have a low cavity rate or if you don't get cavities, that is a wonder and make sure you do not get the version with the nano silver in it. Again, they make a great toothpaste and then they go ahead and find and put nano silver particles in there, which you can never well, really- I think there's a lot of cachet in the, in the popular press about yes. silver. Right, uh, but you, you'll never get rid of it. The body will wall it off. You'll have scar tissue. These are metal particles that do not get flushed out. So so that's good, but Boca and Rizol are fine. I have no affiliation with them, but they have the best form of this miracle ingredient it's not a miracle ingredient. It's th- what's in our teeth right now. It's hydroxyapatite. It's calcium. And uh, and I like it because I like recommending it because I can get people off fluoridated toothpaste, especially children. So, But I think there are products coming. I am aware and I've been consulted with and I've talked to formulators. And there are some great toothpastes that are coming without the surfactants, without the emulsifiers, and with the right amount of hydroxyapatite. And no essential oils. Essential oils actually are bactericidal. They have an effect on the oral microbiome. Most toothpaste, in fact, you can charge more if you just add all these exotic, uh, you know. Uh, Tea tree. Exactly. And and we don't have any data that supports their efficacy or their thera- therapeutic effect, but we do have some data. And I've actually talked to some people that have actually had severe reactions to uh, EOs, essential oils, in these naturally made homeopathic, holistic, integrative toothpaste. So uh, the problem with toothpaste is that it is, it falls under the, uh, the guidance or re- the, um, you know, the uh, restrictions of the cosmetic industry. There is no FDA guidance unless it has fluoride in it. Uh, and then the ADA seal approval is only based on one thing, not surfactants or any other products. It's if, if it has the right amount of fluoride in it. So, so a lot of those, uh, places to go for information. And if you think it's a safe toothpaste based on that certification, uh, it, it, the industry needs to be revamped. And But there is stuff coming probably within this year or next year that I would wholeheartedly recommend because it's what I've been talking about. It's something that actually nourishes the oral microbiome, leaves it alone, helps, re, helps stack the the saliva with all the right ingredients so that the biofilm can pick it up and and take care of itself. And a lot of these minerals are also important for cellular processes. I mean, without magnesium, we're dead in the water. Cells will not mm-hmm. function. Respir- cell respiration will not function without uh, a lot of minerals, especially magnesium. So, so again, we live in a, in a world where we're very deficient in minerals. Uh, that's what toothpaste needs to do. Well, I would say many people might be familiar with, for example, hydroxyapatite based upon their oral supplements for bone health, Mm -hmm. along with magnesium, oddly enough. And probably with respect to the teeth, I would think boron might be an important trace element as well. It is. You're right. right. Absolutely. So we've uh, danced around it, but we're going to have to now talk about fluoride. Right. And uh, that's always been the most important thing to look at uh, in terms of buying a, a toothpaste, especially for children, is make sure they're getting plenty of fluoride. By, my goodness, we better just put it in the drinking water. Right. So let's uh, let's unpack that. Fluoride, very difficult subject. Uh, I've been uh, ridiculed for my stance on it, but my stance has remained very consistent. When Catherine, my uh, uh, oldest daughter, was born, um, we bought a distiller. Before she was born, we were drinking distilled water, adding minerals, of course. Uh, I just didn't feel good about fluoride. It was a lesser of two evils argument for me. I just didn't know what it could do. It didn't make sense. It's not an essential nutrient. Um, It's being added by a large uh, corporate entity, a a kind of an arm of the food industry, which back then, even when I was 17, 18 years old, I didn't trust the food industry. Uh, There was a lot, I was reading a lot about it and was very dissatisfied with what was in our food. And so... 
you know, I raised them all three daughters without fluoride, and thank goodness, because recently, as of, as or as recent as 2006, we're getting these great studies all over the world. We've got about almost 70 of them. Uh, most of them are measuring the amount of fluoride in urine in women that are pregnant, and then the, it follows them up four, six years later, and all these studies pretty much agree on the same thing, that there is imp there is an impact on the brain, mostly on the That's IQ right. of the child. And and let, let me back up a little bit because we want to talk more about that. Um, the problem with the whole fluoride controversy is that it's been associated with uh, kind of a, I, I don't know if it was left wing or right wing, but, you know, ultra craziness and conspiracy theorists and communist plots against the government. They're trying to dumb us down and, and that whole thing. And it, for the, since the sixties. And so I think that's hard to shake. And fortunately there's a lawsuit now against the EPA and that's going well. In fact, there's a hearing today at two 30, which I'll be watching carefully. And even the NTP national Toxi uh, toxicology program in the US. Uh, it's an arm of the government that looks at all the data and makes decisions so that when the government legislates on products that are in our environment, they make the right decision. That report was suppressed, unfortunately, for about a year. The ADA was given a chance to look at it and they suggested changes, which thank goodness were not made, the American Dental Association. Anyway, that report is now live and they agree with the uh, the quality of 55 of the studies and they agree with the results and they now are saying that there is no safe level of fluoride if if we want to play it safe and again back to fluoride again hard to shake that whole kind of hippie uh, anti-establishment kind of approach but i think it's going to happen i think the judge will rule in our favor Fluoride already has been reduced in our water by half. That was in the early 90s because we were putting in too much. It was actually damaging teeth. Uh, but fluoride does not actually help uh, with childhood cavity rates. Uh, we see that in Europe. The cavity rate is about the same as it is here in the U.S., and they don't have fluoride in the water. Fluoride in toothpaste does seem to help. Again, it's like hydroxyapatite. It, it, we need a, a remineralizing agent in saliva, but it does get to the brain via swallowing, of course, and also via absorption through the oral mucosa. So it has to be taken out of toothpaste as well. The fluoride, I think, um, the whole fluoride controversy will hopefully be resolved soon. And it's really, this lawsuit will be very, very interesting. It does have some direct effects on the brain. Uh, it can uh, affect the myelin sheath of a neuron in the brain. It can affect the uh, the integrity of the mitochondria in the brain. We we have this data. Um, it's it's really time that we really start looking at this from a scientific point of view, rather than this emotional discussion of you know is it really what we thought it was back then? And again, no data supporting that it actually really helps. Plenty of data now, thank goodness, as of 2005, 2006, showing that it dumbs down our kids. It can actually affect the brain of a fetus if mom is drinking fluoridated water. These are significant studies. This is significant data that supports the notion that we should really be reexamining this whole fluoride issue. Uh, it's, it's big news. And one of my dreams as a dentist is to see this go down the tubes, literally. Just, just get it out of our water supply. Let's figure out something else. Well, <clears throat> dentists are still offering fluoride treatments mm -hmm. when yep. you get your teeth cleaned. Right. Uh, and, and that's to be avoided? That's a big moneymaker. That's called the fluoride varnish. Uh, uh, average dental office that contributes about $100,000, $150,000 to their bottom line, to their gross for the year. That is, and it takes two or three minutes and it's the hygienist that does it. Uh, there is an alternative coming to that. It is hydroxyapatite based. It's a nano form a very strong version of uh, hydroxyapatite-based toothpaste. And it uh, that hit alone, and by the way, the amount of fluoride in that varnish is way more than what's in your toothpaste, way more. And it, it literally is in your blood supply, in your bloodstream uh, within 10 minutes and hitting the brain. And that happens twice a year to mm -hmm. a child up until age 14. This is not a good thing to be exposing our kids to. Clearly, we have the data. We need to make changes. So there is a fluoride action network. Yes. That and I maybe will, will with the help of uh, mod, modern digital technology, the uh, that website will be right at the bottom of the screen right now, team. Awesome. So what 
can you learn from visiting the Fluoride Action Network? It's a group of uh, PhD physicians, some dentists, uh, surprisingly few, uh, and they have been around for a while. They are behind. They are funding the lawsuit. Uh, it's mostly pro bono work and based on on uh, uh, money being raised by the website. Uh, there are resources for researchers, uh, re resources for um, journalists and for physicians. They have a physicians page and it's a, a great resource for knowledge uh, and you know what to do and 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 also for the layperson. There's a great FAQ section on fluoride. And I think I, I've actually presented this page to people that really don't know much about fluoride. They haven't really been exposed to me a lot. These are people I pull off the street literally. And I say, listen, can you just read that and tell me what you think? And it'll blow your mind. This is information that somehow is being suppressed in the media. Uh, maybe that's too strong of a word, but the people behind fluoride are, are a pretty powerful bunch. Uh, when I was against it, our, our, in the Silicon Valley back in the year 2000, we voted on whether we were going to add fluoride to the water. You'd be, it was curious that we didn't have it. It's because our water supply was very fragmented. It wasn't from a reservoir-based system. And so, of course, it was voted in. But I was at that hearing, and I spoke. And again, in the year 2000, we didn't have a lot of data. And literally... Uh, you know, there were some boos and some clapping and that's fine. And then, but when I, as I left the auditorium, uh, there were three gentlemen that came up to me and this essentially was the fluoride lobby. They were very kind and sweet, but they made it very clear. These were, two of them were attorneys. They made it very clear that I was crazy, that I shouldn't be speaking that way. You may lose your license kind of thing. And, and that to me was a, a, a real tipping point in how I felt about this. This has to be addressed from a scientific standpoint with science, no emotion, no hearsay or circumstantial evidence, which is what, that's how we got fluoride. It was cir circumstantial uh, kind of evidence based on, oh, it looks like this is working, looks like it's working, but it's not. Hmm. And just for historical uh, reference, I seem to recall that Fluoride is a byproduct of the manufacture of um, fertilizer and phosphates. They had yep. all, right, and this fluoride was all left over, and they wanted right. to have a revenue source. And right, it's actually it. it's caught, it's captured at the smokestack in a filter, and, and in the old days they would allow it to you know combust and and go into the atmosphere. And I, I'm not sure when those scrubbers or filters were mandated, but it w wasn't that long ago. I want to say maybe 80s. Uh, and so they grab that. It's a very strong sil uh, silicic acid form of fluoride. F fluorine, of course, is a gas. It's one of the elements, but when it combines with like sodium, it it becomes its state of, uh, its uh, hardened state of fluoride. And that's collected into a truck and it's delivered and paid for by municipal water supplies to add to the water. And sometimes they add too much. Sometimes they add too little. There was a scandal recently uh, of a guy that didn't said he was adding it. He was in charge of adding it to a small town's water supply. And they caught him. And he basically came out and said, I just didn't feel right adding this. I thought that was kind of cute. And to me, he's a hero, but I'm not sure what happened. He could to have him. added too much too at the well, same time. Exactly right. So so it's something, it's something that we have to re-examine. And thank goodness the process is in place now. There are a lot of good scientists behind it. We've got data now. Thank God for the internet and democratization of health data and all that. I, I think we're headed towards a, a, an era where our kids will grow up without being impacted in terms of cognitive ability right out of the bat, right out, right out of the womb, actually in the womb. Yeah, that's for sure. And, and as they are born as well, with reference to their uh, seeds of their microbiomes, depending on the method of delivery. Right. But is it, True. what's the percentage of municipal water uh, supplies in America that have added fluoride? That's a good question. Um, it is probably 80% of the country. We are the most fluoridated uh, country in the world. In fact, we add more fluoride to more water for, for, uh, people that are drinking from the water supply than, than the world combined. Wow. Yeah. That's a lot of fluoride. And yeah. again, American dentistry, I, I will take the blame for it. Our profession has been a big promoter of it. You should see some of the groups. There's one up in Portland that they they are 
borderline violent when it comes to the support for fluoride. And again, I just don't hear any science from them. They're not referring to any studies, but they are pushing back. And you know, maybe they're being paid by uh, the fluoride lobby. I don't know. But I think the days are numbered. The science is overwhelming. Thank goodness. Mm. Well, I know what it's like to push back, believe me, <laughs> right. for, for decades. So I'd like to leave our audience with the tools. Uh, what is the, uh, what's the part of this that they could then uh, employ starting tomorrow in terms of their oral care? What, what should people be doing? Find a functionally trained dentist. Uh, the, the stuff that I'm talking about is not in the curriculum. Most dentists will not be speaking about the things that we spoke about today. They will not uh, elucidate what actually the biofilm is designed to do. They will tell you that it's something that needs to be removed and they'll leave it at that. But there are a lot of nuances in healthcare that are important. And I, I believe that if the patient, the viewer, the listener understands some of the mechanisms or why we're, we're recommending this, that they're going to be better patients. And so you really have to find someone that has this view. And now not every functional dentist will, they may still have fluoride in their office, possibly. I, I've, we have a directory of functional dentists on our website. My daughter and I, who's co-founder of, of Ask the Dentist, uh, we created this problem. We educated millions of people. And now when they go see their dentist, they're just not they're, they're they're leaving empty-handed. They're not feeling great about the care. Maybe it was a fluoride varnish. Maybe it was uh, kind of an aggressive approach to something, and no mention of how to prevent this. What? How about the next cavity? Can I prevent that from happening? So we do have a directory uh, on our website uh, all over the world. It's an international directory. That directory is growing. So find the right provider. Stick with that provider and get the information. If not, you can go to our website. There are other websites now that are passing on this information about the oral microbiome. Read their books on oral on on the oral microbiome that are very lay friendly. I'll give you a link to one. Uh, mm -hmm. It's only a few years old. A lot of practitioners are reading the same book that you, as a viewer or listener or patient, will be reading, and that's a little scary. But know the Not oral microbiome all. and respect it and nourish it. Make sure you're using the oral the right oral care products. You know, you're seeing your dentist twice a year. Uh, but you're using these products two, two times a day and you're knocking down the oral microbiome. So make sure you're using the right, the right product. We have resources on our website that, that piece everything out. But, but what else? Also address dry mouth. If you're falling asleep with your mouth open at night, that is a oral microbiome a buster. I mean, it really is hard for the oral microbiome to recover the next day. It needs a lot of saliva. It needs a neutral pH. Uh, mouth taping is a possible a solution to that. Of course, check with your, your physician, um, go slowly, read up on it. it. It's, it's not dangerous, but not everyone can mouth tape. And, uh, because you have, <laughs> I to saw a one of your podcasts of mouth taping. It was intriguing. It is. Uh, what about water pick? Uh, water pick is great. Uh, just did an episode on our podcast on that. And I think most dentists, as I was, were a little down on that. We've, we've been, we've been, um, preached to for a long time that flossing is king. And uh, the studies on water picks, in some cases, do a better job. Uh, again, this is not a continuous stream of water. This is a pulsation of water that literally, if pointed in the right direction and used correctly, is better than floss. It literally cleans out the pocket and it's safe and it's easier. Flossing is difficult for a lot of people. It is very it requires a lot of dexterity and it's painful for some people. So absolutely, water pick. Uh, highly recommend the water pick. Brushing, of course, use a soft toothbrush. Flossing is fine. There are new flossing devices out there that are absolutely better than using tradi traditional floss. Uh, uh, so, you know, oral, uh, micro mi oral microbiome management is what we call brushing and flossing now. That is important. You can overdo it. You can underdo it. If you're eating a great diet, if you're all paleo or carnivore, you really probably don't even need to brush and floss. That's what our ancestors did. They got away with it. Uh, the minute you start adding carbs and processed foods, fructose, even fruit, dried fruit especially, uh, this is why we have to do this in the modern world. We, we It's our diet. It's our environment. Well, uh, I sure enjoyed our time together today. I, I've been thinking about this for quite some time and really is a very, very important missing area in terms of our understanding of general health issues, inflammation, 
Uh, and certainly as it relates to my area David? of interest as well, the brain, who knew? You know, we talked about the gut-brain connection. Where does it really begin? You know, where it begins in the mouth. So we will get together again, I am certain. And um, there's a lot more, I think, that's going to unfold as it relates David? to the fluoride story, as it relates to new de newly developed products that we can use for better oral health based on the principles that you described today. So I want to thank you for sharing this really terrific information with us. It's been very helpful. So Dr. Brahen, I, I want to tell you, I've been very much looking forward to this uh, interview for a long time because it really answers a lot of questions and, and uh, unfortunately, or perhaps fortunately raises a lot of questions, okay. but this is great stuff. I mean, this is a really, really important uh, area for us to be exploring and does offer up some tools right now of things that, you know, our viewers can do and that, you know, certainly I'm going to be thinking about moving forward. So what, what's it look like moving forward? That's a great question. And you're right. It does bring up a lot of questions. Uh, uh, I'm giving updates to that lawsuit against the EPA on our website. I'm hoping that we can mitigate that or at least reduce it quite a bit. Uh, That's the I, fluoride the issue. The fluoride right? issue, right. Um, I think uh, what I'd like to see is more collaboration between medicine and dentistry. I think that's so important. Uh, somehow we both have to know what's, uh, for example, um, you know, we've had this up on our website for a long time. We have what's called the physician CRP letter, uh, where we, there's a letter on our website that can be printed out by a patient, a viewer, a listener, and then they take that to their physician or to their dentist and typically to their dentist first. But it tells the dentist, for example, if you're a cardiovascular surgeon and you're treating your patient for, you know, heart disease and inflammation, obviously you're looking at CRP levels and, and, and other measures of inflammation, then you really should know how much of uh, that, that part of inflammation is being caused by the mouth, by gum disease. And that's important for physicians to know. And it's very important for uh, dentists to, to be on board with, you know, the systemic involvement. I mean, we don't, as, as dentists, we don't understand metabolic, uh, disease as well as we should. And of course, a periodontal disease is intimately connected to, and fires up, uh, diabetes. And I mean, this is cycle of, of, you know, do you, if you have gum disease, it's going to be more difficult to control your blood sugar levels. If your blood sugar levels are all over the place and it's more difficult to keep them steady glu uh, glucose uh, levels, then uh, obviously your gum disease is going to suffer yeah. because, you know, that's There's a cycle, but you know, you bring up a very good point and that is that, you know, there's no integration. I mean, uh, you know, for years we've been talking about the so-called gut brain connection, mm -hmm. which means that gastroenterologists should be talking to neuro neurologists. Correct. I mean, we've known about inflammatory bowel disease being so strongly related to risk for MS, for example. Right. And yet, um, you know, so what? <laughs> uh, but, you know, mechanistically, they're united and they need to be looked upon uh, through the same lens. And so it is with dentists and uh, regular uh, medical doctors that we need to be communicating mm -hmm. because we're all in this together. And that's the way to have the most comprehensive plan that ultimately focuses on our goal, and that is patient outcome. And right. that is... Uh, you know, the, it, it's challenging. I mean, but people the body tend to be... is beautifully complex, uh, and it's yeah. had billions of years to to uh, to get to that point and to adjust to its environment. Uh, and unfortunately, we all are kind of just working and focusing in our lane. And I think that's a big detriment to the end result, healthcare results for our patients. We need to collaborate more. And uh, and and a great example is now we have very high resolution oral microbiome testing available to us just in the last year. And I- and You're working on that, aren't you? I'm, I'm, on, I'm involved with the company. They're out of San Diego. Uh, it's an amazing test that uh, I've been helping introduce to other dentists uh, with, via continuing education. But I, I would love it if physicians would, get, would take that test. First of all, you should try taking the test. I can, I'll get you a test. And then just, just to see- you know, what the results are and then start making the connections to uh, your own health and, and then, and then to be part of that, uh, because the oral microbiome is, is as much your realm, a physician's realm as it is any healthcare wow, practitioner, as so far as important. I'm concerned. Yeah. I'm, I'm really, really glad we touched on this today and not, not just touched. We did a pretty, pretty good introductory deep dive. Introductory. Uh, definitely. Yeah. Because yeah. there's, you know, certainly much more to come. So thanks for being with us today. 
thank you for considering oral health and in, in all of what you do. It's amazing. And uh, uh, it's uh, it's great to make that connection, especially with a neurologist great. like you. Well, there you go. <laughs> we'll talk soon, my friend. All right. Thanks, David. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Wow. That was enlightening information. We've got to take our understanding of the relationship of the microbiome to uh, health uh, to the oral microbiome as well, including uh, as well the skin microbiome and of course the gut microbiome. The oral microbiome is extremely important for the reasons that we talked about. The direct access to the bloodstream, for example, that bacteria have in the mouth, not having to be dependent upon you know this gut barrier that we've been talking about for so long. It's really important uh, information and especially the part of our discussion today that dealt with the relationship of P. gingivalis, Porphyromonas gingivalis, an organism that clearly links things going on in the mouth to risk for Alzheimer's disease. Important information, I urge you uh, to visit his website. Thank you for joining me today on the Empowering Neurologist podcast. Hope you found this information helpful and looking forward to having you back soon. Bye for now. 